knowledge or information, when we like to do some certain tasks, we can use a system to understand what our intentions are. And they can either return the information we're looking for, or they can actually conduct the task for us. For example, what they has a, a a small chat box called Workday Assistant, they can submit your PTO for you. You just simply say, hey, submit PTO for me from one to one. So that's actually three uh, uh, category of uh, three categories of experience we like to introduce to our uh, uh, customers. Now let's get back to this specific use case we're going to deep dive. We have an application called Expense. So Expense application is to allow your workflows to submit the travel expense and the managers to approve very simple small application. So let's think about what the workflow looks like. You have to scan your uh, or scan your receipt, every single receipt, or you have to you know download the, the, the attachment from some email receipt. Then you key in every single field when you submit the receipt. Oh, this is a total amount I spent. This is the purpose of that. And this is a what, then before you hit submit. So this is a current process. It works for, for me at least, because I don't travel a lot. I travel maybe once every two months. But think about you have a, a professional service consultant job who travels all the time, who is on road all the time to meet your customers. So for every month, he probably has more than 30 or even 40 receipts. Think about the process. Every single time, even I submit the receipts for weekday, a week-long trip, it may take me 30 minutes or even an hour, depending on the receipt. And sometimes you lost your receipt. Then you have to do lots of work on this. For Joe, that's actually very hectic. We have a, multiple customers with those heavy uh, business travel um, groups request us to say, hey, we want something can reduce their you know, headache when they submit the receipt. So that is what we want to solve this problem because after the whole day work, you have to work in the dark to submit this. So what we try to do is, how about we remove the, the manual part of it? You just scan your receipt, then the system will read the receipt and parse that for you. All you need to do is just to say, hey, whether it's right or it's wrong. Sometimes it's wrong, you cor correct it. Just like how we deposit the check nowadays, right? Are you still going to ATM machines to, to deposit your check? Probably not, just take a picture and that's it. So this is a simple um, uh, use case for us. We want to introduce you know, the happier customers, happier users, but it's actually a very, very technical, technically challenged problem. With the data we have, think about your receipt data. You have a receipt from restaurant, gas station, your hotels, your air ticket, your Uber, all kinds of receipts from different languages, different format. Now how this machine can understand this? So this is actually a deep learning issue with tons of data, different type of data. So that's the, the solution we want to provide. Now let's go to the next step. After we understand the problem, now I'd like to share how we explore the potential solutions then how we implement and develop models. At the end, we like to share the experience and learning, how we deploy this capability. Keep in mind, Workday wants this product-driven machine learning approach. Then everything needs to be supported in production. Also think about it, we have uh, customers with million workers. Now how you scale that? Then the traffic actually for experience submission is not evenly distributed. We have every quarter in, you probably get emails say, hey, if you have a receipt or any calls you have to submit by end of uh, Friday, and rest of the month maybe is very light. How we manage those? So deployment with operational KPI is very critical during the deployment. So I'm going to share those three aspects. We start with uh, solution exploration. So even before we decide to take this problem, we ask us why we're even going to do this? Is OCR solved the problem already? We have some free solutions in the market. We also have some paid solutions in the market. Why can't customers just use them? Why we have to be the one to develop this? As a product manager, do we have any product manager in the audience? Cool. Product managers never get enough resources 
to do enough. So we have to say why we prioritize this one instead of others. The short answer for us is yes, we have to do this. Because of the types of the receipts, because of the data volume we have, because of the accuracy requirement from enterprise customers, the existing vendors won't be able to meet it. In addition, we have to do intelligent parsing. We don't just detect the text and that's it. We can parse that for you directly to the application, right? So that's part of a, a consideration we think, okay, we need to do this as a part of what they. We evaluate some uh, vendors from marketplace. Some vendors, um, is a com the solutions from some vendors are the combination of a human plus machine. Accuracy may sound like high, but due to the privacy constraint or the, the real time experience, right? You don't want to wait 24 hour SEO SLA. And you don't want human who you don't know who they are to actually look at your receipt. Some receipts, they do have a PI data, like your, uh, most likely your hotel receipt will have your email address. It may have your phone number. So it's not allowed at the enterprise level to have those process into the solution. So, okay, we're going to do that, then, not, then how? Which deep learning framework we should choose? How we develop our uh, models that can be leveraged or reused? So that's the last part. What can be extended? We don't want to build one time off solution that only solve this expense solution. So we are uh, collecting other use cases, for example, can, can we use the similar uh, models to, to do resume parsing, for example? Can we do invoice scanning and parsing? Can we do student transcript parsing? Some people even ask us, hey, for me to subscribe sick uh, leave on that day, I have to submit my doctor's uh, notes. Can you do that for me, right? So we have to have a, a set of use cases that can leverage, if not totally reuse some of the models. So that's how we decide. This is a solution we're going to do, and we're going to do, uh, it, uh, we're going to develop a solution that can be extensible for other use cases as well. It's not surprising deep learning outperform traditional models or even simple neural networks because the amount of data available for us. So for our customers, we, we believe after we introduce this capability, we'll get tons of data to refine the model. So we believe that deep learning is the one we want to leverage. However, <coughs> we need to decide which deep learning framework we're going to use. So this is what we do before we make any decisions. So there are a set of vendors in market today can provide this deep learning framework from Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Baidu and other vendors. So how we evaluate them to find the one that most relevant to us? So those are the metrics we actually look at it. I didn't list all the <laughs> details the with numbers because I, I try not to confuse or misleading people because we do specific testing that's specifically uh, for us. For example, we have, uh, what they has a um, native Scala stack. So we need to find one who support it. We have a clear mind to support this as a product. So research purpose framework doesn't fit our requirements. We, we care about performance, how fast the training environment can be. Right? We cannot wait for a couple of days just for, uh, for machine to run before we get to the next iteration. We also care enterprise level support. Uh, community is great, you get all the ideas, but whenever issues happen, we need someone, some vendor can support us with enter enterprise grade. With all those considerations, this is the one we chose. We chose MXNet because the faster training turnaround time is almost 50% faster than some other vendor. And the flexibility, so it provides us the flexibility, such as we don't have to extract the input and value into the graph before we use it. So it development and exploration flexibility is also a key for us. Now let's get into uh, the next phase. After we know what framework we're going to use, after we know what the, the data we're going to, uh, to, to have get into this deep learning uh, framework, the next step will be what models we're going to build. How we build this model. If we use a deep learning, how many networks will be required? 
So this is what we do. Giving any receipt, think about it. For the machine, for the, for the, for the machine needs to first of all identify each boxes, each box for every single text or string or symbol. Then it has to read it, then it has to parse it. So there's a three net in natural. Later on, if we add another capability saying, hey, we are not just parsing it, before we parse it, we can categorize your cost. This is a hotel cost, or this is a transportation cost. When we add another network on top of the three already, right? So we have a three uh, networks in this, in this uh, deep learning model. Because we choose supervised deep learning model, we have to build the ground truth. How do we know the machine learning is doing right or wrong? How we can make sure whatever we improved, we think we improved, is actually improving from the machine learning perspective. So we have to have annotation, human in the loop, who actually look at the data and, and tell you the ground truth. Now at the end, because we have a such high enterprise accuracy performance requirement, how can we further improve our model performance by ensemble the models? So those are three big uh, blocks we are considering while we are developing this uh, product. First that, box detection. You get into the raw receipt, then the deep learning model, which this model is based on residual networks, networks but with our modifications. We modify in a way to manage to be robust against the background noise. Think about when you take your receipt picture, the receipt may be on your table with black background, or maybe on the, your kitchen countertop with, with granite, with beautiful granite, but very noisy background. So this model needs to be very robust against a very noisy background. So we have our own modification on the original residual, uh, residual networks, so we filed a patent for that. So the outcome is to find the location of the each text or string or symbol, right? You need to tell me where is the center and your coordinates, of course, with confidence level. So this is a, what the first network will return, right? Array of boxes and the location of those coordinate of those boxes. Then the next step will be, after we box all of those texts, we need to recognize what they are. Is it total, or this is a restaurant name, or hotel name, what each text, or symbol, or digit in each box. So this is what second network does. It takes the box receipt as an input, then return all the text string that attached to all of those, right? So this is a, uh, another deep learning model based on residual network. Again, because we change some of those, because of modification, we can do much faster job than just regular uh, residual network. So we found a patent, patent for that. So you can see the output, just all the text, all the string. Then we are going to the third network. We detected boxes, we read the string. Now it's time for us to decide which snippet of text are relevant to, uh, to your expense. We don't submit all the strings, all the text into your uh, expense report. We just submit some of those. Basically, fundamentally, minimal is a total amount, is a merchant name, is a date, right? It's currency. So we have to find those from all those texts within those boxes and parse them into the application. So this piece actually is, um, it's not the deep learning model, it can be rule-based, depending on different applications. If rule-based solve the problem, you don't really need to uh, get into machine learning model. So this one is just uh, uh, the rule-based plus some of machine learning. So we generate a map, okay, this is a, the value, this is a string, then we pass them to the application. I already say annotation is a must to have here. Human in loop play critical roles with deep learning or other machine learning uh, models. But for us, because we have three networks, we need to have a courted, a, a courted, uh, annotation process as well. We find those humans who can actually draw the box and identify all the text and highlight those texts, those, those, those string of text are relevant to the field from each individual application. So there are a set of vendors available today to do annotation. 
So we do our own uh, intelligence due uh, diligence again to identify which one we're going to be partnering with. So we particularly look for the platform compatibility uh, uh, here. We have some vendors purely driven by human. Uh, we think we need uh, the platform with some kind of intelligence can scale our human in the loop operation. <coughs> we also focus on uh, the worker, right? We are, are those workers. Who are those workers? We won't be able to uh, to work with some vendor who has offshore workforce. We just privacy and security. So privacy and security plays critical role when we choose annotation vendor. And also the uh, quality assurance. How can we know the annotated data is correct? We use them as a ground truth, but we have to make sure the ground truth actually is the truth. So we do that, rely on their internal uh, quality assurance policy, how they manage their, before they hand in the work to us. We also have our own internal data analysts to, to, to do some sampling check as well, to make sure you know, we trust the data returned by this annotation vendor. So this is a, uh, we, we actually choose figure eight, originally called Crowdflower, to be our partner to do this process for us. And then last is ensemble model. Just to improve the performance, what we do is we have a three networks. So on the network one, when we detect the box, usually we see it has different scale, different size, small, big. How we find different models to, to optimize all the receipt. Three models may be optimized for different sizes or scales, but we have three of those. Then during the reading, right, we have a, a characters, we have a symbols, we have a digit. We can find different models that optimize for specific characters or for symbols or for digit. So we have those five readers together. So when we come up with this multiple value before we parse it, so we choose the majority vote approach what are the most likely be the value we can parse. So that's how we come up with three networks plus five networks, a total 15 networks, three times five, before we parse you know, the, uh, the, the value to our applications. So this is how we improve the performance of the model. So last piece, so after we get models ready, we get performance need our requirements, the last piece actually is how we deploy that. So this is a super, super critical piece for us to deploy, deploy machine learning as part of a product. The number one question is, what should be deployed model? So this is actually very enterprise specific. For any consumer um, product today, you don't need to even consider per tenant model deployment. So it's just global model. You need, you have a one model that your, all your customers will share that one model. But most, most of the use cases in Workday or in other enterprise uh, solution providers as well, there are per tenant models. For example, uh, lots of HR use cases we deploy as a per tenant for multiple reasons. Of course, we, 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 there's no data sharing, there's no anything shared between tenants. Uh, tenant for privacy and security concern. There's also a different feature, the feature engineering is slightly different per tenant. So we have a, a solution called retention risk to, uh, to classify and predict the risk level of your organizations and your employees. So with that, we are not just deploying the per tenant model. We deploy multiple models per tenant model because we can analyze your organizations who, you know, uh, with, uh, with different retention risk factors. For example, your engineer leave, leaves your company compared to your salesperson leaves your company. Their, reason, their reasons might be very different. So the feature set is very different. So it's not just one global model that, apply for, that applies for all, uh, one model within a tenant or multiple model within a tenant. So for us, we need to decide are we going to deploy this as a per tenant model? Every, every tenant will get this model. Or is global model actually working for this one? It is, right? You know, all the receipt types in Workday system we know. That's another benefit of Workday because we have, we host all the data from all the customers. As long as we can train the data, we know this is an old data set, very specific data set we manage. So this is a 
one criteria for us saying that we're confident we can do a global model that meets everybody's um, requirement. And we don't need to share this data back to, uh, to our customers. So when, when the model is deployed, your users use that. When, when users detect the value didn't meet the original value, in other words, the value is not accurate, they modify it. But what we take is, we only take the value is modified, but we don't take what has been modified from the model. So we don't really capture any data from the tenant to our training environment. We just gather the feedback, whether it's right or wrong. Because we believe we have enough data for us to reiterate, retrain, we really don't need to capture that. But we need to work with individual customer. If they're willing to let us know, it would be, um, it will be great, but today is one global model. If we improve this based on specific customer data, all customers will get benefit. All customers will get the improvement. So this is critical because Workday is actually a global company. We support multiple locales. So for this one, we primarily train the model for uh, English, for all for English locale. Uh, Model itself supports different languages, but we cannot claim that until we validate it with the real data. So if we get the data from certain country, we validate that, all other you know, countries within the same region can utilize that model. So we don't have to retrain, use their data within their tenant. So that's the reason we choose global model. Then the next step will be, okay, we choose global model. Should we use GPU or should we use CPU? Because when we have this deep learning uh, training framework, we choose MXNet with GPU, but should we, should we do that uh, with this? The GPU is much more faster. You got simultaneous response. Is that necessary? And what they data center be very transparent. We don't have a GPU yet. If we decide to deploy it with GPU, so we have to do lots of infrastructure work. So we did some uh, study. Um, what typical user workflow is for those heavy travelers like Joe, your uh, professional service consultant. They typically uh, take the picture of your seat and submit it. But they don't really do one picture, then check the value, submit, then another picture, right? What they do is they typically do, okay, one picture, two picture, let's say five pictures. They all upload it. Then they check one by one. By this scenario, when you upload your fifth uh, uh, receipt, your first receipt result is already coming back within a minute. So it's adequate. It's not instant, but it's adequate. It's enough for users. So we don't have to choose uh, GPU as a, a deployment requirement. By enable this in our current data center with CPU, there's no extra charge for customer. You can just use it, right? So that's how we choose that. The last way is, um, as a part of a product, as a part of the operation, we have to come up with those KPIs. How we measure those? How we measure your customer adoptions? How we measure what's the right KPI for us to measure? So I'm going to share some of those KPIs with you. Uh, the feature is introduced, was introduced this March. So from, it's five months already since we first introduced this. So we have uh, 53 customers who, <laughs> who, about 2%, I guess, more than 2% customers uh, enabled this. Among those 2% customers who scan uh, receipts, 58 of those customer, uh, users actually using this feature because some of those are just use that as a, a attachment, as a part of our original expense workflow. But those how we can see, this is how uh, customer adopt this feature. The next one is, okay, what's the traffic pattern looks like, right? Every week, how many receipts the system uh, get in, and how many active users and how we aggregate into the multi-week uh, multi status. So we decide, okay, this is some interesting data we like to follow, just in order for us to, uh, to plan the capacity. And lastly is the performance metrics, right? The accuracy definitely will be the one. So during using our um, test data, our accuracy is far beyond 80%. So actually 80% is a threshold for us to decide go or no go as a part of a product release. So after we think, okay, it hits 80% accuracy rate, we can go at the field level. In production, um, I, I didn't put any data here. So far, with, search, with, with customer data we have, with customers who use this, 
the accuracy level actually is higher, much higher than 80%. Some of those are hitting 90%. But I don't want to list this one here because it really depends on the, uh, the, the, the data pattern. Some of the data may not hit the same level of accuracy. So that triggers another question. So when we communicate the machine learning solutions with our customers, what's the right message we should send? Can we just simply say, hey, our solution hit 80% accuracy rate? We can't because we never know what kind of data we get from their data set, right? So we always say, if your data is similar to what the data we have used for test validation, this is the accuracy level you will get. So this is the accuracy. And another one is just average you know, time to take to perform. So we did a very interesting testing here. We have, uh, uh, we have tested with Workday Data Center. Again, it is, it's within a minute you will get response back. By the way, today many vendors SLA window actually is 24 hours. So we get it back into a, a minute. If you run this models on your Mac, actually it takes you a second. <laughs> it's not like, okay, our data center is slow. It's, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Workday, Workday data center is optimized for memory operation. It's not optimized for computing. Mm -hmm. So your Mac actually is not optimized for memory, but operation but it's maximized for computing. So that's why you can see the, the, the difference uh, between the testing. But we think within a minute, totally meet our SLA. Uh, yeah, the comparison for this. So before we are getting our, the true data, we actually use a lot of other data sources to build the base model. For example, uh, the, the, the first network to identify those boxes, we use some public data set just to uh, generate the, the data to build the base model. Uh, then we can improve based on that. So this is a one, uh, one way we're doing this. Similarly to the uh, second network, when we get the data, we, since we, we use public data set, we also uh, gener generate some synthetic data to cover different, you know, different sun fun size, different color, or different distortion, how we actually come up with a base model with some uh, level of uh, accuracy so we can further improve with the real data. So with the real data, this is the real data. With this 40, more than 40K real receipt, then we actually improve the accuracy from 50% to 80%. Uh, we build our base model based on anything else but not real data because in, in enterprise, getting real data is so hard. <laughs> Even we hosted all the customer data, but we actually think data is in the safety box. Without the key we get from customer, we don't even touch the data. So that's a part of uh, uh, the agreement we have. Uh, that's how serious we are. So as a product manager, we were so desperate to get real data because we all obviously 50% cannot go out the door as a product. So what we did is we, we have this receipt context with the work day across different global offices. Within a month, we got more than 40K real receipt. So that's how we get the data uh, to really deliver this solution. Uh, you have to be very creative and because of the, all those frustra frustrated, you know, I would say not frustrated, all the challenges we are facing with the data, we come up with a new innovation service agreement so customers can log in, uh, can sign and opt in. The customer has a right to decide whether they want to be part of it or not to be part of it. So we give them the transparency for them to decide what they want to do. It's just introduce similar consumer experience with full transparency. If you don't want to use it, which fine, but if you like to use it, that's how we uh, specify what data field we access and specify the process we're going to use it. Everything is super clear. And the customers also get the opportunity to opt out. So if we decide to opt out after a certain period, we will you know, uh, delete all the data we host in the system. Just to make the data communication super uh, super transparent. So to recap, right, this is how this solution works. Get the raw data, scan it, go through multiple uh, uh, deep learning models, then capture the value, then send to your uh, applications. Okay, this feature is just within what the expense application. So our goal is to enable machine learning intelligence 
across all applications. So we deliver machine learning as a part of application experience, but we don't deliver machine learning as a part of a technology platform, or you can use our algorithm or models to, to, to run your own data. We embedded them into the, uh, into the patients. So the next two pages are some of uh, uh, machine learning capabilities already available now, and some of those we are working on across HRs, across uh, financials. Then I will leave the last minute for Maybe one or two questions. Uh, we are almost uh, one minute away. We can try very quick question, very quick answer. Go ahead. Um, when you mentioned those different models, did you use them for scanning different types of receipts, or is it all applying to one type of receipt? All kinds of receipts. You can think about your receipt from your restaurant, from your hotel, from your uh, Uber, all kinds of receipts. That's exactly the reason why we need, more, you know, different uh, ensemble model to support more. Do you feel that one is going to be better at scanning certain types? Like, then, the, you know, how do you, how do you pick and choose? Uh, that's a good question because uh, based on the data we have, right, we have a slightly different model we test out. We, we find, okay, this model uh, works better for this kind of receipt and different model works better for different one. So we have those multiple models running sim uh, simultaneously, then we, when we get the data, we have this majority vote policy. Okay, if 60% of models thinks, okay, this is the right one, we'll take this one. Yeah. Good job, excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. I know you are doing so many other things, not only this.